have the courage to step up. Our attitude should be, this may have been passed down, but it's not going to get past me. This is where it ends. This is where the depression stops. This is where the addiction, the low self-esteem, the poverty mindset comes to an end. Don't live with the dysfunction, break the dysfunction. Well, nobody in my family is successful. We just barely get by. That's what was passed down to you. That's the way it's been, but you're a Phineas. You're putting an end to that. You're called to rise higher. You're called to put a stop to that plague. But Joy, everyone in my family struggles with addictions. We all compromise. We all have anger issues. That would be a good excuse to stay that way. If not for one thing, you're a Phineas. You have the courage to step in. Listen to me, many of you right now, life's got you up against the rope and you gotta do me a favor. Like you can't give up, you can't give in. Pain is temporary. Pain is your friend. Pain is gonna take you to the next level. When you going through pain, I know what you feel it. I know exactly because I've been there, I've done that, but you gotta work through it. And the reason why most of you are not successful is because every single time stuff not going your way, you give up, you quit, you let go, and people feel weakness, they feel it. You can feel when somebody's not committed. It's hard to defend yourself when the murmuring of the voice of accusation is stronger on the inside than the voice of all the critics on the outside. Guilt is not just about what others are saying about you. It is what you are saying about yourself. Who is renting space in your mind? Who are you giving your thought life access to? I mean, why in the world would we be talking about what, what we might be thinking about? Because nobody really realizes this, but the mind is the battleground. You know, whatever you think about in abundance is most likely what you're going to see in your life. And there are all types of things battling for your thoughts. Because as a man thinketh, then in his heart so is he. The progression is affect your thinking first and then get it in your heart and then you become that. And I'll start it off with your thinking. It is the condemnation that comes upon you. It is the struggle that lives down inside of you that you say, what was I thinking? Have you ever looked back at something and you just wonder, what was I on to do that? What happened? Did somebody put something in my coat? What happened that I went that far? See, this one of the things that we do with guilt, because it is such a heavy burden to carry, it's a heavy burden because it can only exist in places where you care. So it becomes a heavy burden to carry. So what we do is we change the narrative of what happened to make the memory more palatable. We block out the parts we are ashamed of. And we remember how people responded to us without remembering how we elicited or initiated the response. Selective amnesia. And so this story that we tell ourselves about what happened causes a certain toxicity to the soul that stops us from getting what God would give us because God will only fall on truth. And you have told yourself a lie so long that you can't be delivered because you can't admit the truth. You're in fear. Well, what you're thinking about? You're angry. Then what you're thinking about? You're depressed. Well, what you're thinking about? Peace or worry can be a result of what you've been thinking about, what you've been giving your attention to, what you've been considering. You are what you think. So you start the day off as this grateful creature, this grateful soul.
this grateful person. You start your day off as grateful and it just spirals throughout your day and it puts you in a great mood. Try it. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change power and success in the world. Everything begins with thoughts. It's time for us to move. So get your joy, get your smile and pack your bags because we're leaving depression. We're leaving the fear. We're leaving sadness and the questions and we're stepping into the fullness of who we were called to be. What happened earlier this week and it only took 15 minutes, but you can't get it out of your thought life and it's shaping you. It's messing up your access to wisdom and it's hindering your happiness and your joy and you can't live the life that God wants you to live because you're occupied with the last thing that you've been thinking about. And it, it's become abundant in your mindset. And your mindset determines really where you're going to go. And you got to be careful. And it's a real thin line between what you're going through emotionally and what's happening spiritually. And sometimes you're thinking something wrong between you and God. And it's just an emotional mindset that's been created by how much attention you've given a thing. You're still making progress, but you might not feel like it because you've given attention to that other thing. You still heal, but you might not feel like it because you've given too much attention to the negative part of it. The one way to coach your mind from depression is with gratitude. Just start writing down everything you have to be grateful for, whatever it is, your health, you can walk, you have a car, may not be the one you want. I ate today. I have a place to live. I got a friend that I can call and share my troubles with. And just be real detailed with it. You would be stunned how long you'll be writing. Now, let me tell you what happens. Gratitude erases all negativity because there's no room now for negativity. It's not a magic trick. Joy and depression cannot reside in the same space. Those two things cannot exist at the same time. Say thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for parents. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for humility. Thank you for peace. Say thank you in advance for what's already yours. True desire in the heart for anything good is God's proof to you to indicate that it's yours already. One of the great things about giving is that as you give, you're going to receive. What we want to do is keep the flow going. If anybody gets the bucket of love and stops and holds it there, all of us suffer. They've short-circuited the flow. They've stopped what was going on, the energy that was going around. See, you are part of an equation, and you are needed. Part of why we should begin to look at how we give up our lives is that we've got to begin to see what is it that I'm supposed to do? What is my life worth? And then give ourselves to that. Because as we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, as you begin to take on this new era that we're in, if you decide that I'm going to begin to start living life generously, I'm going to start giving more of myself. I'm going to start putting out more, contributing more to life. Here's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. I guarantee you that life will take on a whole new meaning for you. I guarantee you that as you begin to give more of yourself in your work, give more of yourself in your marriage, give more of yourself in your relationships with your families and friends, give more of yourself to your talent, to your vocation, to your job or your business, as you begin to set high standards for giving that which you have been given to share in the universe, I guarantee you that life takes on a whole new dimension. Life is worthwhile if you learn. You got to know, you got to have the information, get the information while you're here, right? There's nothing worse than being stupid. So jot this down now, as I used in my notes, what you don't know will hurt you. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is tragedy. Ignorance is illness. 
Ignorance is devastation. Ignorance is going broke. Ignorance is, creates a poor life. So you got to know, you got to have the information. Number one, learn from your personal experience. One way to learn to do it right is first mess it up and do it wrong. That doesn't mean it's the end of your life. But just, you know, clean up the mess. Now do it right. From a negative experience, sometimes we learn to do the positive things that saves our life and makes us successful. They say, if you survive your first heart attack, you may now live to be a very old person. Why is that? That first heart attack was a wake-up call. And then maybe the doctor said, another one of these in your history. And you say, wow. And you make it for the health food store. And you start reading every book you can read on health and nutrition. And you start doing the push-ups and you start jogging on the beach and doing all the stuff. And all of that change now could very well help you to live a long, long life. Having been alerted in an alarm system that serves you well. So learn from your negative as well as your positive experiences. Here's the next. Learn from other people's experiences. That's how you get smarter in a shorter period of time. Somebody that's been through it for five years and they wrote a book. And the book, if you read it, could save you five years. Cost $30. You just, you can't miss that kind of education. Best to get the information before. Yes, we can recover. Yes. We can come back, you know, from the grave, practically. Yes, we can come back from bankruptcy and disaster and poor health. But wow, if we had the information up front that would save us some of those years of disaster, how much better that would be. So learn from other people's experiences, both negative and positive. If a guy's messed up his life for 40 years, you just have to say, John, would you spend a day with me? And I'll bring my notes notebook and take good notes. Good looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, and you threw it all away. Teach me for a day how you messed it all up. And you just take good notes so that the same thing doesn't happen to you. So learn from your experience, learn from other people's experiences. If you learn, life is worthwhile. Here's the second if. If you try, you got to now try something from what you've learned. We've talked about that now earlier. Take action. You never know. My father said you never know until you try. Giving speeches and doing talks. Age 25, I stand up to give my first little training. My mind sat back down. I open my mouth and nothing comes out. My knees are knocking like this. The sweat is pouring. It's called terror, in case you haven't tried it, right? But I got through it somehow. It was so bad, if I hadn't have been doing the class, I'd have gone home. Right? It was bad. But I got through it. And then I did it again. You know, I didn't know if I should even try again. But sure enough, I had the kind of mentor and the kind of teacher who said, hey, that's nothing. You know, what if you go up to bat and you strike out? Does that mean it's over? Say, no, it's not over. It's just over for one time up at bat. And then another time and another time, pretty soon you connect. And pretty soon you get good enough to do well. And then pretty soon you get good enough to win the game. And then pretty soon you get good enough to take home the trophy. So you just keep trying. The third if that makes life worthwhile is if you stay. You've got to hang in there. Some people plant in the spring and leave in the summer. When it gets a little hot and a little uncomfortable and it looks like the weeds are winning and it looks like the bugs are having a feast and you have a tendency to say, hey, I've had it with this. But the key is if you want the harvest in the fall at harvest time, you've got to stay through the summer. Even if the harvest doesn't turn out to be good, you just see it through and then use that experience to do better planting in the spring come the next turnaround of seasons. So stay in there. If you're going to play the game, you've got to stay until it's over. What if the team was, you were on the team and you guys were behind and you said, hey, we're so far behind, we're out of here. And you all walked off the court, right? We would run you out of town probably. 
We wouldn't own you as the home team. Say, I'm behind, so I'm out of here. No, you stay until what? It's over. We're not talking about a lifetime now. We're just talking about this game. If you're in it, stay till it's over. If you sign up for the game, you don't have to go to every game. But the one you sign up, you stay. Right? You don't have to do everything every time. But when you start it, see it through. See the seasons through. Then you don't have to plant anymore if you don't want to. But when you do sign up, go. Go the distance. Life is worthwhile if you stay. Hang in there. Next, life is worthwhile if you care. And for my little talk for the service clubs, here's how I wound it up. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you can get extraordinary results. If you just care at all, you'll get some. But if you really cultivate your caring character and care enough, you can have such extraordinary returns from productivity, activity, things you're doing underway. Have something good to say. Here's the next one. Now we must learn to say it well. Once you've got something, now you can't mumble, right? It's got to be clear or no matter how good the message is that you've got to deliver, how good the instructions, how good the ideas, no matter how good they are, if you don't deliver them well, now the power is lost and the opportunity is lost. So number one is to have something good to say, and number two is to say it well. Here's what will help you to say it well. Make this list. Number one, sincerity. If a message is delivered with sincerity, see, that makes all the difference. If the speaker is sincere, if the father is sincere, if the mother is sincere, see, that's captivating for the children. If the friend is sincere, even covering a delicate subject for us, of some changes we probably should make. If they're sincere, see, we will give them room. Perhaps to get on our case if we know they're sincere, not just trying to criticize for criticizing's sake. If your sincerity, I'm telling you, that wins the day. Here's what can really be accomplished. Hopefully, like this weekend here, someone sincerely willing to speak and someone sincerely willing to listen. Now, in terms of lecture, book, seminar, and all the rest, we must come to this conclusion, because it's a wise conclusion, that sincerity is not a test of truth. In your study and evaluating everything, just make sure you have that in the back of your mind. Sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right. He's so sincere. See, that might be a mistake. Why is that? Here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So sincerity is not a test of truth. Here's the only test of truth. Truth. Truth is the only test of truth, not sincerity. We hope someone will be both truthful and sincere, but we don't mistake sincerity for truth. Here's next. Repetition. To get better at something, you just have to go do it. Go do it. Accept every opportunity to go make a little talk if that's going to be your business. Get better at talking to your kids. Come up with more illustrations. Come up with more ideas. Read an extra book, how to communicate with teenagers. So you'll have something a little better to say. And then just practice it. Get good at it. Get better at it. Right? I was clumsy when I started. Now the words flow a little easier. I still struggle with the language, trying to make it clear. But it's easier now. Repetition has helped me to do that. Here's what's next in good communication, saying it well, brevity. Right? Don't take too long to say it if you can say it in shorter sentences and shorter time. One way to learn brevity is to talk to kids. You talk to kids for 30 seconds and they say, how long is this going to take? It's already too long, right? 30 seconds. I mean, they got games to play and things to do. They can't hang around for, you know, an hour's discourse. So talk to kids. It helps you to make it more brief. The storyteller tells us Jesus wandered around the countryside in putting his 12 together. And as he wandered around the countryside, every once in a while, he would say, you follow me. See, that's short. Why could he be so brief and so short with that simple appeal? Jot this down now. Probably for who he was, not just for what he said, but for who he was. There was something about him when he said, you follow me, see. Probably his reputation, probably his manner, 
probably with how he said it, irresistible. So here's what's powerful. And you can talk less and even be more effective in this personal development area. The stronger you become and the wiser you become, the more caring you become, it shows in your language and your manner. The texture of your communication changes and reaches where it couldn't reach before. It strikes the heart where it didn't strike before. That's the key here. Next, style. Now, you've got to develop your own style. You can be a student of style. There's about a dozen people that I know over the years that if you knew those dozen, you'd say, hey, you know, a little bit of each of them appears in Jim Rohn's style, which is probably true. Not copying any one person. But I like the way the person said it this way. I like the word person's gestures. Because I used to be a little too stiff without, you know, gestures. So make this note, not it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Style, sincerity, the way you present it, heart, soul, from deep inside, commitment, dedication, wrapped up in your language so that now when you present it, hey, it becomes incredibly effective. Next is vocabulary. The better your vocabulary, the better you can share ideas that are meaningful. Find words now to use that you couldn't use before. If you were very limited in your ability to comprehend because you had such a small vocabulary, that no matter what someone said, it would still be confusing. No matter what they said, it still might not make sense. They said it clear, but you couldn't see it. And sometimes that's because the vocabulary is so limited that it doesn't have the ability to register the scene on the screen of your consciousness. What if you could only see the world through this little tiny hole? You would be inclined to say, the world is like this. And all of us would say, no, no, the world is like this. This person would say, no, no, it's like this. How come they keep insisting the world is like this? Because that's all they can see. They're limited in the scope of their ability to widen their perception about life and what's going on and what's happening simply because they don't have the vocabulary to understand. So they started working on vocabulary and immediately behavior started to change. Being able to see, being able to comprehend. Oh, now I see. Oh, now I understand the reason why. And as your education increases, that should be one of the major purposes for education is to help you see things you couldn't see before. Comprehend what you couldn't comprehend before. See a future you couldn't see before. See beyond tomorrow you couldn't see before. See, that's a gift. Vocabulary. So keep working on your vocabulary. Now, here's another reason. Only from with our present vocabulary can we express what's going on in our head, what's going on in our heart. You can't express beyond your present vocabulary. What if it's very limited? Then your ability to express what you think, express how you feel, is limited. So by a very restricted vocabulary, if you can't understand very well, and if you can't express very well, then your world becomes very, very small. So jot this down. Make one of the books, very important book, and that is the dictionary. A word you don't understand? Come to a word you don't understand, you look it up. Say, what is this word? Words are like lights. Now make this note now, especially the English language. There's nothing richer than the English language because there's so many ways to say it in English. In some languages, there's only one way to say it. In English, there's another way to say it and another way to say it and another way to say it. When I travel to all these countries and have to have translators, it gets to be difficult sometimes expressing something that makes sense in English because we have several ways to say it, but in their language, there's only a couple of ways to say it. So the translator has a tough job. So you have to learn how to present how to do the stuff, but the gift of language is so powerful, it's worth the exercise, it's worth the effort. Vocabulary, brevity, style, repetition, sincerity, saying it well. Here's another one on saying it well. Don't fail to say it. You need the practice. Practice everywhere. If you're going to give someone a gift and send a little card, practice making this little card something they'll keep and remember for the rest of their life. Not ordinary, extraordinary, not like everyone else, different than everyone else. 
It's the practice of using your gift of saying things another way until a light turns on, another way that expresses something heartfelt that the standard ordinary language wouldn't express, couldn't reach, couldn't paint these mental pictures. It's okay to give flowers, but don't let flowers do all your talking. Flowers have a limited vocabulary. Guess what flowers say? You remembered. That's about all they say. Flowers don't say, nobody in this world affects me like you do. Love. See, flowers talk, but they don't say that. That you got to put in the little card. Nobody in this world affects me like you do. Love. And then you sign it. And see, long after the flowers are gone, somebody's going to keep the words. The words are more powerful than the flowers. So don't let flowers do all your talking. See if you can't choose the words that are meaningful, words that are unique. And the more you do this, practicing every little occasion to say something well, whether it's a little talk to the family gathering, or whether it's training, or whether it's inspiring, or a little class on Sunday morning, whatever it is, keep improving, keep improving, find a new way to say it, a new illustration, a new story, you'll get better. The gift will belong to you, and the effect could be electrified. Don't fail to say it. Here's an expression we've heard. Words are no substitute for action. That's true. Let me give you another one. Action is no substitute for words. It's okay to do, do, do. But you've also got to say, say, say. Express it as clumsy as it might be to start. Start a better program of better communication, saying it better, saying it better. Here's the next one now that's really challenging, but it, it really works, and that is read your audience. Whether it's an audience of a child or an audience of a training class or whether you're a minister and you preach, here's what you've got to do. Say something well, but then read the effect you're having. If you're talking to a child, should you really pour it on or should you hesitate? Should you save this for another time or do it now? Some of that you've got to pick up by reading the child. Read what's happening to your audience of one or a thousand. This is a challenge, but it'll help you in framing better the words you need to say and the style you need to use. Now, in reading, there's three things. Jot these down. Three things in reading your audience. First, you read what you see. Salespeople can soon learn. If the customer's got his arms folded and his chin tucked down and he's frowning, this one ain't going to be easy. All right, this one's going to take all my skill to get his arms unfolded, make him a little more comfortable, get that frown off of his face. What can I do? I got to reach in my bag for some good stuff, right? To see if I can't sort of change the situation. And what causes us now to do those amendments in our presentation? It's reading, reading someone's body language, right? What's happening? Here's the next one. You've got to read what you hear. If it's a two-way conversation, you got to listen as well as talk. Mama said two ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk at least, maybe more. Listen so that you can now know how to proceed, especially if you're talking to a child. You listen so that you know how to proceed. And by listening, you pick that up. Here's the next one. you got to pick up the emotional signals, how you feel, whether you're coming on too strong whether you should be stronger or easier this time. That's an art in reading. First, what you see. Second, what you hear. Third, read how you feel. Now, this is where women really have it made, being able to feel, sense. And they pick it up. Men can learn better on how to pick up these emotional signals, but women seem to have it. Because there's no use going on and on. If the signal should have told you, wow, this is not the time, this is too strong, picking up not only what you see and what you hear, but what you feel. Now, here's the last one. To achieve good communication, something good to say, saying it well, reading your audience. Here's the last one. Intensity. Intensity is the emotional part of communication. Communication is both words and emotion. Here's what's really powerful. Words loaded with emotion. See, that's what's unbelievably powerful. It can move nations. It can help people change directions. It can establish an ideology for good or for bad. Look at Hitler and his ability to preach. 
Look at Stalin, his ability to preach. Lenin, as wrong as they were, they believed it with all of their heart. Disastrous results, but they put everything they had into it. The emotional content was unbelievable, powerful. Yes, in an evil direction, but it can also be used for a good direction. This intensity, strength, power, emotion. Now, here's the craft, and conversation is a craft. Don't get lazy in learning this craft because it'll serve you so well at home. It'll serve you so well in the marketplace. It'll serve you so well in your career and making your fortune. This craft of communication. Here's the combination. Well-chosen words mixed with measured emotion. Not only do the words have to be well-chosen, the emotion has to be well-measured. 